All right, thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this workshop. Um, as you saw, I already had this slide up on some getting started notes. Uh, if you want to follow along with the exercises or do them on your own later, then you can clone them from this repository. Normally, I've done this workshop as more of a half day long thing, so I'm not sure. Uh, we'll see if we get much time for the uh, exercises. But uh, if someone wants to stay after the talk and work on that uh, together with me, then that's fine as well. We can find somewhere to, uh, to sit down. But hopefully, we'll have some time to walk, walk through some of them at least. And uh, the GitHub URL will be at the bottom of the slides uh, moving forward. So a quick uh, agenda for today, just a quick introduction, um, and then go into a little bit about why you want to do uh, stream processing. Uh, we'll dive into a bit more on Kafka and Kafka streams, and then we'll go into more detail on the Kafka streams API and how to develop using that. Uh, we'll cover some of the basics, like filtering and transforming your data and routing it to different places. And then we'll look at uh, also some uh, examples of aggregations and uh, time handling of time. All right, so first of all, who am I? Uh, why am I here to give this talk? So my name is uh, Fredrik Rolsen. I work as a data engineer in uh, Shipstead, in the data platform team there, um, where we work with all these kind of cool technologies, uh, a lot of uh, stream processing using Kafka. We also use Spark, for example, for our batch processing. Um, most of you have probably not heard of Shipstead, but it's, uh, it's a company that owns a lot of classified sites and media sites across Europe and other parts of the world as well. So, um, for example, uh, Le Boncois in France, uh, Blocket and Finn in Sweden and Norway are some of the big ones, uh, but we also have uh, others uh, in other parts of the world. So these are kind of three main business areas we are in. We also have tech hubs in multiple places in Europe. We have about 2,000 uh, developers spread across uh, mainly these sites. So in my team, in the data platform team, we are sort of responsible for gathering uh, events from all of these different sites and making them available to our analysis teams. So during the course of a, a week, you can see this, this kind of pattern that we have. So we receive around 800 million events per day, uh, clickstream events mainly, but also other types of events, from around uh, 30 to 40 sites across the world. As you can see, the load varies a lot uh, across the day, so we need to be able to scale to varied traffic. By the way, feel free to stop me if you have any questions along the way and just raise your hand. I'll try to, to catch it. So briefly going through our data pipeline. Um, like I said, we receive events from various sources, uh, from our uh, apps on iOS and Android, uh, our websites, of course, through our own tracking solution, and from a, a set of uh, backend systems or components as well, like, for instance, uh, messaging events, payment events, and so on. All of these go into our uh, uh, microservice named uh, Collector, uh, aptly named where we then push all of the events onto Amazon Kinesis. For, that's kind of our first stable storage for the events. Uh, from there, we pick up the events and pipe them into our two main pipelines. So one going through S3 in, and into our batch pipelines, where, uh, people, where we sort of gather all the events into hourly data sets, and, and people can do various analysis jobs on top of those. And then we have our streaming pipeline, which is what we'll be talking about today using Kafka and Kafka Streams. Uh, our team is mainly, as I said, responsible for making the data available to the different consumers. So what we use Kafka Streams for in, in our team is mainly to sort of distribute the data, split it into different data sets. In here, we get everything into one event firehose. So we need to sort of demux it again into different type based, based on the event type and what site it comes from and so on, for example. And then we send it to various downstream consumers. Um, we support uh, the, the main uh, sort of uh, services in Amazon, sending it to Kinesis and S3 or SQS for messaging uh, based handling, or uh, various third party tools like Amplitude, for example, which is an anal analytics tool that we use uh, for some of the analysis purposes. Right, so in addition to our, the team, the pipeline that our team has built in terms of doing this processing for the stream stream processing. Um, we also have other teams that have built on top of our platform using Kafka Streams. So one of 
a couple of examples are uh, one team has built this uh, data quality analysis tool that we use for our events to ensure that the events contain the right kind of data that are useful for the downstream analysis teams. <laughs> Checking the formats of the events, the content, and so on. And making this uh, so we kind of get this closed loop in terms of uh, the developers on the sites can look at these dashboards and see whether the events they send to us are, are as, as expected. As I mentioned, we've done integration with an analytics tool. So we have our own tracker solution for, uh, for the web and our apps named Pulse. And, and um, so instead of having to use many different trackers on the sites, we try to then instead send the events from, from our tracker into multiple analy analytics tools, doing transformations uh, along the way into the format that they require and so on. So this has uh, allowed us to easily set up new integrations with third-party tools, sort of negotiated with uh, Amplitude, for example, and how, uh, how to send events into their platform. And this has allowed us to onboard new sites and components into these analytics tools very easily. We've also created a number of other data-driven applications on top of this, uh, ranging from sort of uh, experiments, uh, experimentation tools, like for A-B testing, for example, uh, maybe you went to the, the talk by my colleague uh, yesterday on uh, GOIP uh, enrichment of the events. So that's one of the things we were built on top of this as well. Uh, we have image uh, featureization uh, applications that take uh, images that are uploaded, for example, to the classified sites and do um, image analysis on those and post this uh, uh, y using events coming from, from the streaming uh, pipeline. Another, another example is messaging intent analysis, so you can tell based on a conversation between users what their intent is and, and then offer uh, sort of a specialized UI, for example, for handling some of the replies or something like that. All right. So why do you want to work with streaming? Um, well, I mean, typically you want to use stream processing systems for uh, getting more real-time analysis uh, um, results, right, or in low, lower latency. Um, maybe you are familiar with the Lambda architecture, where this is sort of um, proposed a, a couple of years ago, where you have, the idea at the time was that you, ha you typically had your batch jobs processing events every hour or, or every day, but you wanted to have more online, more real-time uh, results as well, so you added this uh, stream processing layer here, or the speed layer, to get more up-to-date results. And then you would sort of merge the results from the two layers uh, in when you queried for, for data. The idea here was kind of that your speed layer was giving you faster results, but they were also more inaccurate. You didn't have all the results, or you might not have the same uh, guarantees for processing and so on. Uh, the pros of this uh, batch layer was that you had all the raw data, you could do reprocessing quite easily and so on. Did any of you catch the talk by Lars Albertson, uh, talking about the 10 failures of data engineering? Yeah. So he talked about this sort of, it, it, you typically have more tool support for doing reprocessing and stuff on the batch side. If you have errors in your code, you can fix them and redeploy and, and reprocess the data more easily. But I think it, it, it has sort of changed a bit in the last couple of years. So it used to be the case that you didn't have the same kind of guarantees when it came to the accuracy, for example, of the stream processing. But this has changed with the new uh, frameworks that are, are available now. You have much better uh, guarantees. And, and in some ways, stream processing is actually now sort of a superset of what you can do in batch. Um, talking about stream processing, what do we kind of mean? Well, first of all, when you talk about batch processing, for example, you typically talk about bounded data sets. You work on an hour or a day of data or so on, whereas in stream processing, you have unbounded data sets. There's sort of potentially no end to the data. You always have new data coming in. Uh, so this is a feature of the stream processing frameworks that they support handling this kind of data. You might also have more uh, need to handle unordered events. Uh, events come in out of order or, or delayed, for example. This can also happen in a batch layer, though. I mean, you might have uh, a device that is offline and then suddenly comes online if you're, for example, traveling by plane. Suddenly you have events that are several hours late coming in, and, and most batch pipelines that I've seen don't really handle that. If you have an events 
come in that late, they are either discarded or included in some later data set or something. So stream processing has sort of built-in features to deal with this kind of things. And then the, the newer uh, things like Kafka Streams and Flink and so on, and, and newer versions of the other ones as well, you have much better correctness guarantees. You have guarantees for uh, at least once processing or even exactly once uh, processing of events. Uh, you have consistency in terms of storage and, and handling of failures and so on. And you have more built-in ways to deal with time, and especially, as I mentioned, uh, for example, handling late events. A typical example is that you, you, you aggregate some values in, in time windows, and then later on you have events coming in to, that actually belong to that same time window. The stream processing frameworks then, then typically allow you to publish an updated result for that time window. So you can have incrementally more accurate results as you, uh, as you move along. And it gives you the sort of the knobs you need to, to tune to, to deal with this. All right. So let's in, get into Kafka a bit. How many here are using Kafka? That's about half or so. Uh, Kafka Streams, anyone? A few people, more or less the same people, I think. Um, all right. So just a, a brief intro to Kafka then. Um, so there are quite a few people who are not using it. So Kafka is essentially a log-based system. So you can think of, uh, in principle, Kafka writes events to uh, an immutable log. You start at the beginning, and you just append events to the end. Um, and you can essentially keep the events for how long you, you want. Uh, consumers of the events can then read this log at their own pace and, and uh, sort of so if one consumer is reading from here, the other is reading from here, they're totally independent of each other, and they can read the same data. Uh, and you can add new consumers. They can start consuming. You can also do things like uh, rewind and reprocess the data quite easily. You just move the pointer, essentially. Like if you were here, you can just reset to the start of the log and reprocess. For example, if you have fixed a bug in your processing algorithm, then you can just reprocess and recreate the, the more correct results. In addition, in order to achieve uh, higher, higher uh, performance, what Kafka does is it splits this log, or a topic as it's called in, in Kafka, into multiple partitions that are spread across the Kafka cluster. So typically, each, each server in the Kafka cluster will have one or more partitions belonging to a topic. And this allows you to spread the writes to a topic out across the cluster uh, sort of the, the, the other side of this is, of course, that you, you lose sort of global ordering here, but you still have ordering within each partition. So if you are smart in how you assign data to the different partitions using uh, keys in the events, then you still have, uh, can, can achieve the ordering that you need, typically. And of course, these uh, topics and partitions are, are uh, replicated across the cluster. So that if one of the nodes in the cluster goes down, then you can just con uh, resume consuming from another server or writing to another server. So on the consumer side, uh, you have sort of the same picture where you have used these partitions for, uh, to achieve parallelism. Uh, but you also have this concept of consumer group, which uh, so a single consumer uh, can have multiple threads consuming the data from a given uh, topic. And what Kafka will do then is uh, will essentially just automatically uh, divide the available partitions. So in this case, we have tw 12 partitions to our topic and three consuming threads. So each of them will get four partitions to consume. And these threads can be running on the same machine or on different nodes in the cluster or whatever, depending on your, uh, what kind of hardware you use and, and so on. Now, if you need more processing power, you can easily add another consumer thread, and Kafka will automatically redistribute the, the workload among them. So you don't have to deal with this at all. And it, because of how it takes care of um, uh, offsets and checkpointing and that and such, you will ensure that you will always have, uh, still always process everything as needed. 
and you can tune this uh, in terms of the guarantees that you want. Uh, I think the default now is set up for at least once delivery of events, uh, but with the new features in Kafka 1.0 and uh, Kafka Streams now, you can also have it do exactly once processing of events and transactions across the partitions and so on. All right. So, uh, so what are the events that we have talked about so far? To Kafka, uh, Kafka events are essentially a, a key value pair. But Kafka doesn't really care what the keys and values are. To Kafka, it's just a byte array. So it's up to you to bestow meaning upon this and do the sort of uh, serialization and deserialization, whether you put JSON or strings or, or Avro messages or whatever on the Kafka topic. Kafka doesn't really care. Uh, the only thing it sort of cares about is this key that the determines which partition your message will end up on. So for instance, if you, are, uh, if you have a set of events for a user, you might want to use the, the user ID as a key so that all of the events belonging to the same user end up on the same partition and, and in order, right? Because you don't have ordering guarantees across partitions, but if you use the same key for events belonging together, then you can achieve that, uh, that ordering. Looking at uh, stream processing frameworks to then actually process the, these data, this data, uh, there are a number of options. Um, so here are some that we have evaluated when we were building our platform. Uh, we were looking at Spark streaming, for example, since we were already using Spark for our batch processing. And uh, things like Akka and Samsa and Flink, uh, which you probably have heard about or even are using. But we ended up going for uh, Kafka's own solution, which is uh, Kafka Streams. And this is uh, something they released a year and a half ago now or something, maybe two. It was fairly new, at least, when we, when we picked it up. Um, one of the main reasons for, for, uh, for us to use this was that it's essentially just a, a library, a lightweight li Java library that you can run and include in any Java application. And you just deploy it as a regular Java application, and the Kafka mechanisms takes care of all this distribution of the partitions and so on to your consumer. So there's no need to set up like a cluster that you need to deploy your application into and stuff like that. This is nice for us. As you could see on one of my first slides, we had very sort of varying amount of traffic uh, along the day. So we we wanted to be able to use auto-scaling mechanisms in uh, Amazon Cloud, for example, and that allowed us to do this. So just uh, deploying as a regular Java application and uh, on EC2, auto-scaling auto cluster, and based on the load, you could just remove or add nodes as needed. And the Kafka library took care of distributing the, the work among the available nodes. Like most of the stream processing frameworks, you have this notion of both of, of uh, streams of events and also tables. So what you can do is you can use various aggregation mechanisms, for example, to, to get aggregated values for, for your entities um, and store them in tables that you can then look up and join with and so on. And we'll have, some, uh, we'll have a little bit of look, uh, look at a little bit about that later on. Also, you have a, a high-level DSL, which uh, looks very similar to the Stream API if you use that in Java. Um, or if you use functional programming in other languages like Scala, for example. But you also have access to the low-level sort of processing topology and, and uh, framework if you, if you really need that. And we have used that in a couple of cases as well. So Kafka Streams try, I, I stole this graph from their, one of their uh, documentations. They're trying to sort of hit this uh, simplicity become simpler to use than some of the other frameworks that you have uh, while giving away a little bit of power. But still, you can do quite a lot of uh, stuff using uh, just Kafka Streams. So some of the features that uh, Kafka Streams provides, very similar to a lot of the other uh, stream processing frameworks, of, of course, is that you can you can, of course, filter your data. Uh, you can use this to, uh, of course, tailor the stream to the, just what your consumer wants. This can also be useful in, for example, a privacy setting if you want to filter out events for a user that have said that they, don't, they want, don't want to be processed, and so on. Um, you can transform the events, bringing them into the form that's uh, expected by your downstream consumers, for example, or whatever 
just remove the data that you don't need. Uh, also, from a privacy standpoint, that's quite nice if you want to do data minimization. So you only keep the actual parts of the events that you need for your further processing. You can, of course, compute various aggregates, uh, all the typical stuff like counting and creating, uh, computing sums and so on, but also a lot more. Um, and you can deal with uh, this aggregation typically in terms of time windows. So you can aggregate the number of clicks on a site per hour or per minute and so on. And Kafka handles the aggregation or the time windowing then for you. Um, and of course, you can also join streams together and also streams on these uh, aggregate tables together to enrich your data uh, by uh, joining multiple data sets together or streams together. All right, let's go look at some code. Uh, so the basic anatomy of a Kafka Streams app, right? So it consists essentially of, of uh, three parts. Uh, if you write a Kafka Streams or just sort of a pure Kafka Streams app, you have uh, some configuration that you need to sort of, the minimal configuration is that you need to tell it uh, where to find the Kafka cluster, and also um, then an ID or a name for your, for your application. The second part is that you need to build your streaming, stream processing topology. And we'll get into that more in the following slides. And finally, uh, you need to, of course, start your Kafka Streams processing. So essentially, you just create an instance of Kafka Streams, give it the topology and configuration, and tell it to start. And typically, also register some kind of shutdown hook so that it shuts down properly when, when your application is uh, terminating. So these are the three main things that you need. Of course, you might need more configuration to deal with setting up timeout values and stuff like that, but I don't want to go into details on that right now. But let's have a look in more detail on what building a topology looks like, because that's where the, the fun is, right? That's, act, that's the actual, actual work. Um, so we have the streams builder. Let's see what we can do or Stream Builder, I think that's a typo here, actually. Uh, they changed the API and naming of things in uh, 1.0 slightly. So we have a Stream Builder. And as I mentioned, Kafka doesn't care what the data is. To Kafka is just bytes. So you have to tell it how to serialize and deserialize the data. And it uses this concept called a CERD, short for serializer, deserializer. And it has a bunch of them built in, so you can deserialize uh, string uh, byte arrays into strings, for example, in this case. So I have uh, here, I'm building, I'm consuming a stream or a topic called articles. And I'm saying that consuming this with a key type of string and value type of string. And this gives me back a K stream, which is sort of the basic. Uh, component in, in Kafka Streams. And uh, okay, since this is a hello Kafka Streams example, what do we do with it? We print it out to standard out. And this will show something like this. So here you have sort of the, the keys, comma, um, the values. As you can see, the keys are not in order because they are spread across multiple partitions. In this case, I have only one consumer, so it will consume all the different partitions in one, but it will receive sort of random, uh, it will be random ordering between the partitions. So that's why you don't see one, two, three, and so on here, but you'll have the events coming from the different partitions interleaved. As you can probably also see, the actual events or comp values here are, seem to be JSON, so, if we want to consume the events as JSON instead of strings, we can also tell um, Kafka Streams to do that. Um, so what we need to do then is create, it doesn't provide this by default. So you need to create this sort of JSON node cert, but it's essentially four lines of uh, Java code and a bunch of boilerplate. Uh, and if you clone this repository, you will see an example of how you can do that. So it's essentially just using Jackson in this case. Uh, the Jackson JSON framework, and, and it's three or four lines of code. So, and then since I then uh, specify that the value type is now of JSON, I get a case stream of string type for key and JSON node for my value. And the printout still looks the same since it's still JSON. 
oftentimes you will have the same, you will repeat the same sort of key and value types a lot in your application. So instead of having to specify this explicitly, you can also configure the defaults here. So you can, in this configuration section that we showed earlier, you can add configuration of default third classes for your keys and values if you want to. And then you can just say, create a stream from this topic and, and leave out uh, the consumer. All right. Time to move on to some more, more code, more um, examples of what you can do. Any questions so far or no? Everything, everyone keeping, uh, keep, keeping up? That's good. Um, all right, so I mentioned you can do uh, filtering. So we, we have our, our uh, stream of uh, article data from uh, uh, various news sources. And I want to fetch just the ones that come from BBC. Now, if you, if you know uh, the, the, the stream API in Java, for example, this will look very, very similar. Uh, you do call a call to filter. This will take in uh, the key value pair that you can do the filtering on, and you just return true or false, depending on whether you want the event to uh, be filtered out or not. Or sorry, the opposite, if you want to keep the, keep the event or, or not. So in this case, I'm just looking for the events where BBC equals the site of the JSON event. And this will give me then back a new case stream uh, with the same type, but with only the events that I expect. If I print this out, I'll get only these three events. Uh, we can do more, of course. We can do um, not just filtering, but also transforms. So if I want to have just uh, not the entire event, but just the titles, for example, um, how do we do this? So in this case, I can use the method called map values which takes in the, the value of the event and just returns a new value out. So in this case, I extract the title event, the title uh, value from the JSON and return that as a string or as text. And now you can see also my case stream type, uh, the type of my value has changed from JSON node to string as expected. Now if I print this out, of course, I get just the titles, the same keys though. I haven't changed the keys. Is any of you, are any of you using Scala with uh, Kafka? No, uh, a few couple. So yeah, they've made this, for some reason, even though Kafka itself is implemented in Scala, it's a bit hard to actually make the, the API work nicely from Scala, but they're fixing this in, in Kafka 2.0. They're adding a separate Scala API. Um, and that's actually supposed to go into code freeze today with a release candidate, so we'll see, hopefully. All right, of course you can also join these two together like you can with the regular stream API in Java, so you can just have this as one expression where you do the filter and map as a chain of operations. Now, we're still just printing this stuff out and that's probably not what you want to do, right? You want to put this data back into, uh, into your system, so that you can do quite easily, writing it back into Kafka by using this to method on your uh, case stream just provide it with, uh, with the um, topic that you want to write to, and then also specifying how should you deal with the, uh, with the data. How do you convert it back to byte arrays? And then if I, from my command line, I, I can use the, the command line interface for consuming data from, from my uh, topic, and it will uh, show me these three uh, titles from, uh, from the data that I had. All right. So this is the, so map values is sort of the simplest transform you can do. You also have, sometimes you need to convert one input event into a, a series of output events. Uh, for example, if you extract uh, a list of uh, data from inside of your uh, event object. So converting from one input event to, uh, to many, or zero in the case sometimes, 
Uh, if you again, if you know functional programming or the stream API, you can use the flat map operation to do this, and that essentially that that takes in the value and you return an iterable of whatever type output type you have. So this works nicely for collections and arrays, which are iterables in, in Java. Uh, sometimes you work with iterators, and that is a little bit more hassle, in particular in the case here of, of JSON. So I want to extract not the title of the uh, article here, but the list of authors. So there could be one or more authors of a, a newspaper article, for example, and this will actually fail because this returns an iterator and not an iterable. Um, and and uh, the, the API doesn't support that. So, but it's quite simple to create an iterable because what an iterable in Java is is essentially just a, a, a function or a class that returns an iterator. And we already have the iterator, so we can do that quite easily. Um, but there's a simpler way to do this, since this is a single abstract method. We can replace this whole thing with just an operation or an anonymous function that, they, that has no input parameters but returns an iterator. So you get this kind of funny looking structure here. So we have your input value, and it actually returns a function here. So we have a function that returns the iterator. And that works. So that's how you can extract multiple events. So, but if, if, you, uh, if you already just, uh, if, if you have something that returns a collection directly, you don't need to have this sort of funny looking uh, operation here. Yes? Yes. Since I'm doing flat map values, I don't change the key. You have uh, similar operations called uh, flat map and, and just map that allow you to also change the key of the, of the events. I'll get back to that a little bit later. Uh, but that, uh, uh, sort of, as I mentioned, the key determines where your events end up, right? So if you change the key, you need to move them around, essentially. We'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, the final sort of basic thing that, that uh, I wanted to mention is that you have support for uh, branching of events if you want to split your events into multiple streams. Uh, you can do that. So essentially, you just uh, call a method branch, and you provide it with a set of predicates. And it will return an array of streams. So in this case, I, I want to split my events into streams for articles from BBC, CNN, Fox News, and then whatever is not covered by those. So I will get back four streams, and I can these are just regular case streams, so I can write those out to different output topics, for example. And the things I've gone through now are essentially what we have used to build up our main streaming pipeline. The filtering transforms and this branching is what we do to uh, essentially the building blocks that we use to, to move all of our incoming events to the different downstream consumers in the format that they expect and so on, using these simple building blocks. So I think we're pretty good on time. So have, uh, have you all been able to download and, and get the code from the GitHub repo, or at least some of you? I figured if you, if you don't have it, then uh, if you want to work some, together with someone, uh, that's also good. Um, I won't spend that much time on this right now because I think uh, we, I can go through some of the examples later on and then you can also work on this on your own or we can hang out after, uh, after the talk and go through more details. Does that sound good? So I'm thinking we spend about 15 minutes on this now, then do a short break and then I'll go through some of the exercises after. I'll go, if people have questions, please raise your hand. I can go around and help out. Um, there are also some example code showing the different things. So uh, let me actually open up the, um, the, my IDE so, to show you. Let's see if I can get the window here. Where is it gone? 
Uh, display, no. Mirroring, all right. Oh, come on. No, not that. All right, can you, uh, it's a bit small maybe. Let me change the font size here. Uh, like so. Is that readable? I hope. Um, so if you open this repository, you will see that you have uh, examples and exercises here. And uh, the goal of the exercises is to essentially, uh, they're written as tests that uh, initially will fail. So if you run the Gradle build, you'll see that you have, have like 16 failing tests or something. And the goal is to actually have the tests pass by filling out what I pass in is this stream builder that we saw earlier, and you're expected to create an output topic containing some particular data as described in the, in the, re, uh, in the sort of documentation above each of these methods. So there's one sort of just basic example here which just passes the events through unchanged, just to give an, an idea. Uh, there are also some example code uh, in the neighboring package here that you can have a look at as well. Um, if you are adventurous and want to do this in Scala, there are uh, similar examples and exercises in Scala, but you need to change uh, some, a value here in this exercise base to uncom uncomment the Java exercises. And, and, uh, sorry, yeah, I've, I've already done that, but so you need to switch these two if you want to use the um, Scala ones. Does that sound good? All right. Let me know if you, uh, I'll, I'll walk around. Uh, we spent about 15 or 20 minutes on this, I think, and then we'll, uh, I'll go through some of the examples and uh, exercises after, and then continue, continue with the second part of the talk. So raise your hand if you, wanna, if you have questions or any, any issues. I'll head around. All right, uh, just one thing, uh, which I p forgot to put, put up here, is that uh, if you don't have the Scala plugin for IntelliJ, uh, it might not be able to compile, so in that case, you need to compile from the command line using Gradle. You can still use their IDE or any text editor to, to edit it, but um, I think it requires the Scala, since the tests are written in Scala.
So uh, I, I got a question about the slides. I just uploaded them earlier to slideshare.net. So if you go there and search for uh, Kafka Streams Workshop and uh, Frederick, you should probably find them, um, hopefully. O otherwise, I'll put up a link after. All right. I think I'm going to start just going through some of the uh, exercises, uh, show you some of the solutions. And we won't, ha unfortunately, have time to go through all of this now. But I see at least a lot of you have gotten started, and that's good. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you want to hang out uh, later and work on more of the exercises, that's, uh, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Or you can also do it as homework, of course. All right. So let's see. I'll just go through a couple of the first ones just to show you. Uh, what it, what's, the, what's expected here. In the Git repository, there's also a solutions branch that you can check out and, and have a look at if you want. So you can see some suggested uh, solutions here. Most of these uh, examples uh, require only like three or four lines of code. So what we want here, if we look at the exercise, we get in a set of uh, strings and lines, and we want to return uh, just the length of that string. So that means, um, sorry, we need to create our input stream first from the topic um, text. And that is consumed with uh, strings and, and uh, strings, right, as before. So we have our, uh, our input stream. We can call that lines. So now we have our input, our input data. Can people read OK in the back there? Uh, I'll, I can even collapse this one and make it a slightly larger, um, like so. So on lines, we want to do map values. Then since we are transforming our value from uh, the, the text into the actual length of the text. So we have a line, in this case, as input. And we, are just, we just want to return the length of that. So we can do that. Or as IntelliJ is happily reminding me, I, instead of uh, doing line the length here, I can replace this with a method reference if I want, just referring the, the length method on the string. I am kind of partial to actually using this form, so uh, but up to you. Um, lengths. And finally, we want to write this out to our output topic with the to method, the topic name, from here, line lengths, and then uh, produced, not key third, with strings as the keys still, but now our uh, values are, are integers, so we need to use the different ints third, which, so the thirds are, are provided up here. And here you can also see this JSON node cert that I mentioned earlier. If you want to look at how that is implemented, you can navigate to that. And you can see that there's a bunch of empty boilerplate stuff and exception handling, but it's essentially, essentially just like four lines of uh, actual code. Anyway, back to this. Um, and we can, of course, uh, we don't have to assign everything to intermediate variables here. So we can inline a bunch of stuff. And it, typically, you will see something that looks kind of like, kind of like this. That's fairly common to see uh, a format for it. Now, uh, words per line um, is very similar, uh, but instead of counting, I'm going to start with the, the same uh, code essentially, just to get a bit faster here. Instead of counting uh, the number of characters, we want to count the number of words. Uh, easiest way to do that is to uh, split 
uh, the line on spaces and then just do dot length on that. And that will be words per line. Now, let's see if we can actually run some of the tests here. Um, um, no, OK. Exercises. Let me just find my exercises here. Um, Why is it not? Oh, here. Here's the actual tests that I need to run. Um, run. So if you if you run this from the Gradle command line, it, it actually that works too. But it will output quite a lot of uh, information. So sometimes it's easier to see in the in the IDE uh, whether stuff is working or not. But that, as I mentioned, requires that you have the Scala plugin installed. So if you don't have that, then use the Gradle one. Now, it's a bit small here, but maybe you can see here now that the three first tests are green and the rest are still red. And that's uh, the remainder of the exercise. I'll show, I think I'll show one or two more, just to show you, show you some examples. So here, uh, all the words is an example where we want to split uh, one line of text into multiple events. So we can start out with the one that we had up here again, perhaps. Um, but now, instead of splitting and returning the length, we actually just want to return the words themselves. But this doesn't work with map values, of course, because then we uh, will instead return uh, our data type would be array of strings, but we want to still the output to be strings, just the individual words and not the whole lines. So this is where we want uh, flat map values. And it doesn't, uh, let's see, split. How does it work again? I thought it would. Oh. Yeah, so the trick here, since it doesn't handle arrays directly, but it does handle collections, you can use the built-in uh, arrays uh, helper class and do uh, as list. And that will give you, um, and now of course our output type is not ints, but it's strings. And the compiler is happy. The only thing we need to fix is the name of the output topic, like so. Now if I rerun my tests, hopefully we should have one more green test. And yeah, we do. Get all the words to screen. OK. Um, yeah, the, if you guys, as I said, want to go through more of this uh, after the talk, then I'm very happy to do that. But I think we should move on with uh, some more of the content. And I also have some questions in the, in, uh, the break here that I wanted to cover uh, at the end, if we have time. So let's see if I can switch back here. Um, I wanted to turn off mirroring. And back into presentation mode. All right, so we covered, uh, and you saw some examples and worked a little bit with some of the basic features that allow you to do essentially kind of ETL-like behavior using Kafka streams, just taking your events, moving them from somewhere to somewhere else, and possibly doing some transformations along the way. Um, but sometimes you want to do some computations on your data as well, right? And that's where the aggregations come in. So if we stick with our uh, example of uh, news articles, um, I want to compute, I don't want to see just the raw stream of articles, I want to compute the number of articles that are published per site. Uh, and this is very similar to what we do when we get our clickstream events in. And you want to count the number of visitors, for example, per site, and so on. Um, what you can do then is instead of doing um, your map and, and so on, the case stream itself, you want to create something called a k-grouped stream. So what you do is you essentially you take your input events and you tell it to group your event by some by some value. So you, based on your key and your value, you can group your events, in this case, by the site of the article. And 
what this does is essentially uh, create a new key for your events. So you're, you are uh, re-keying your events so that all of the events that belong together end up in the same partition. Um, I had to actually sort of borrow, <laughs> this, this picture is borrowed from a Spark documentation or, or talk. But what you want to do is in order to be able to, to do aggregations on a set of data, you need to ensure that all of the events that belong together are ending up on the same node so that uh, you can process them together. Does that make sense? So that's kind of similar to what you do when you do this repartitioning and, or uh, in, in Spark, where you move data around and you can, uh, uh, Spark does a lot of this sort of under the hood for you in a, in a more sense, but in Kafka streams you need to be more explicit in terms of what you want to group by or how you want to group your events. So this, what happens then in, in Kafka streams is that it will actually create an intermediate topic for you uh, that you write to with this new set of keys so that uh, the events end up together that you want to, to uh, aggregate. This repartitioning will happen not only by this group by operation, but by a bunch of different operations. As, why, as we talked, we already looked at map values and flat map values. They, those don't touch the keys, so they, they do not trigger this repartitioning. But if you use map, which allows you to change both the key and the value, and similar for flat map, or any of these other operations by select key, group by key, and so on, uh, they will trigger this repartitioning. And that and thus sort of move data across your Kafka cluster um, so that you, you get everything together. All right, so back to our code. So we've done this group by operation here, gives us back a K grouped stream. And, and this has a, a new set of methods that we can apply. And uh, the simplest one in this case is we can do a uh, call to count. And a count will return not the stream, but a K table. You remember we, we mentioned briefly that you have this duality of kind of streams of events and tables with aggregated state. So in this case, we will create a table which aggregates the state for each key. The string is the key is a string here, and it's this site ID. Uh, we will have an increasing count of articles as we get new events coming in. So this, here we have sort of all of the raw events. Here you will have a stateful store inside Kafka streams that you can query and do things with, uh, and also join with other data streams. So we can, again, we can sort of, uh, how can we look at this? Well, uh, first of all, we can of course also put this thing together as a single stream of uh, transformations. If we try to print this out, it will typically show us something like this. So it will not necessarily show us all the intermediate states, uh, as it will sort of periodically output new aggregated values. I mentioned this as a duality, because you can actually look at the tables and streams as two different viewpoints on the data. So if you have a, a database table, you can easily create a stream of uh, changelog events for your data, right? So here we uh, change a row or add a row. So we can output this as a changelog. And then we add a new row. We can output this as a changelog event. Now we change an existing row to a new value. So we just output a new event with a new value for that key, and so on. And this is very, very much what your actual databases do, right? They're, they're transaction logs and so on. So if you, if you think that your database actually has everything stored in tables like this, it's typically that at least the latest changes are in a log kind of like this. Um, but you can do the opposite as well. Given this stream of change events, you can recreate your table, right? That's the whole point in the database transaction log is that you can recreate your table states. So you can sort of view these as uh, two different views on, on the same data. The difference is that in, in a K table and typically in a database, you only see the last version of your state. But in your uh, stream of events or your change log, you have every change to, that happened to your data. So it can be, both can be very useful, and, uh, but this ability to go sort of back and forth is uh, kind of core to how Kafka Streams works. All right. Um, yes, I wanted to also talk a bit about uh, windowed 
aggregations because um, those are very powerful. So you can do aggregations just like uh, across all time, but typically you want to group them into some time windows. So Kafka Streams lets you do that very easily. You can specify different types of time windows. You can have uh, tumbling windows. Uh, you can have time windows that overlap, kind of like you just uh, you have a 10-minute window and you move one minute ahead, uh, for example, all the time, and and it, it will automatically then group together. Uh, the records that uh, belong together, and you can do aggregations within that time window. So you can count the number of events per five minutes, for example, in, in this case, or do some other kind of aggregation. Maybe you want to the count or some are sort of the, the simple ones, but you can essentially do any sort of reduction operation that you want or aggregation operation you want on, on your uh, data. Because you do get event access to the raw events, and you can combine them however you want. So if you want to uh, concatenate strings or do whatever, uh, build up a map of a value seen in a, in a given hour or something, that's totally doable. And then have that sort of output as a new change log, but with this time window information on a new Kafka topic. Um, Right, so let's look, have a look at what this window will, uh, will look like. So instead of having the simple count that we had earlier, we want to have this count uh, number of articles seen uh, per hour. And instead of, so we still do this group by operation, but instead of doing a, a count, we will, on our grouped stream, we do a windowed by, and we give it a time unit, in this case, one hour. Uh, and then we tell it to count, and then we need to give it a, a state store. So what it will do, it will keep an internal state for this aggregation um, in an internal key value store, essentially. So by default, Kafka Streams uses uh, RocksDB as its internal state store. You can configure it to just store stuff in memory, or you can have it actually spilled to disk if you are uh, having large amount of uh, state, for example, or if you want to have more durabil durability. But even, even if you're, the cool thing about this is that when, sort of behind the, cov uh, behind the scene here, Kafka Streams will create not only this internal state store in the key value store, but it will create a change log for that key value store as a stream of events. So you can always, sorry, if, even if your node goes down and you need to take it back up again, you can just consume again this change log and build up your state store and continue uh, consume, uh, consuming from, from where you left off. Yes. Yeah. So it, it, it's both represented. Uh, the question was: is it, is it both represented as a table and as a topic? Yes. Uh, that's exactly what it is. So internally, it, it's a, represented as a table in a key value store and as a change log topic with the changes to that table. Um, and we saw when I, I showed briefly an example of uh, printing it out, and that that was essentially the, the change log it printed out from this table. OK, so um, all right, so we have the state store, but what, what can we do with it? Um, well, we can, uh, we can query it. We can connect to it. it this is just, a, again, it, it, you can include Kafka streams in any regular Java application. So typically, what you will do is you will have an application with Kafka streams embedded in it. And then you can just query that using, for example, a regular REST API that you provide. And that REST API can query the internal state stores inside of uh, your Kafka Streams app. So you remember we, gave, we materialized this thing as a, as, a, uh, as a state store, and we can then also query that. So I can ask my Kafka Streams runtime for the state store named articles per hour of type window store, and I will get back a queryable state store. So from this, I can say, okay, I want to look at all of the counts of articles for BBC from the start of time, which is in this case is uh, January 1st, 1970, 
uh, or epoch until now. And then this will give me a list of all of the aggregated states it has in the, in the state store. Um, so this iterator, I can iterate over using the regular mechanisms in Java. So for each key value, I can extract the key and the value and just print out, for example, in this case. Or I could re respond to a REST API call uh, with a set of JSON objects or whatever. So in this case, I just print out to, to standard out. So I only have one time window populated here, so that's all it's going to give me. But if I had multiple ones, it would show me a list of outputs. So you can, you can have your uh, REST API then fetch the state store query for uh, data and, and respond with, with that. Now, uh, this is simple if you have all of your data on one node, right? But typically, you will have a Kafka Streams app, uh, or very often at least, you will have it distributed across multiple nodes. So the challenge then is that your state will actually be distributed as well, since each node will only know about the data given from the partitions that it is consuming. So you might need to query across your consumers. Um, and this is kind of where Kafka Streams doesn't really give you everything for free, but you still have APIs you can query to see uh, where is the data located for this given key and so on. But you might need to implement things like retries and stuff if a node suddenly goes down as you're trying to query it and move data moves around. So you need to deal with those kind of things uh, on yourself. yourself. But if you have something that lives in just a single node, then, then it's quite easy to, to do this. And that depends on the amount of data that you need to process and aggregate, of course. Yes? Yes. Yes, exactly. So the state for a given key, uh, if, you, if you add multiple consumers or, or, or if you add additional consumers or remove some, your data or state will kind of move around, right? Is that your... Yeah. Excuse me. Um, so when you go to build your state store again, uh, your state store is going to come from... Kafka and rebuild itself with the partitions that are associated with that particular client? Yeah, so what the, what the, the new node that it's added, for example, it will uh, read this change log, building up its internal state store, and when that is ready, it will sort of take over processing that, uh, that partition, I believe. Okay. Uh, and of course, then the client that was the query needs to ask Kafka where, or the, use the Kafka API to figure out which of these nodes has that information I'm, I'm interested in. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. Now, um, I have a second set of exercises, but I don't know if we should go into those right now. I think that we can, uh, let me see. I have actually have a couple of slides I wanted to go through in addition to this. Um, I would rather, spend time, I think, uh, if you guys have questions and stuff. But um, so another thing is, uh, in, in addition to just um, querying the state store, for example, um, you might want to get data into other systems or out of other systems. Um, Kafka Streams itself only supports Kafka. Right? So you can only consume from Kafka and produce to Kafka. This is different from a lot of the other uh, stream processing frameworks that support multiple data sources and data sinks. Uh, but, but they've chosen to keep Kafka streams uh, as simple as possible, only dealing with Kafka, and then they have other mechanisms for getting data in and out of Kafka itself. So in particular, uh, Confluent and, uh, and the Kafka open source project as well, as well provides this component called uh, Kafka Connect which allows you to connect to different data sources and things. So it could be a database, it could be uh, S3, for example, and so on. And it will, you can deploy various connectors into this Kafka Connect cluster, and it will take care of pushing data in and out of Kafka for you. And it will, for, um, 
For certain setups, it will also sort of give you these kind of guarantees that you have in uh, for exactly once processing. For for uh, but that I think only if you're using Kafka, so mostly Kafka end to end, uh, with some additional uh, support. But but uh, this works very nice, I think, for for connecting to various uh, sources and and sending data to downstream consumers that are not consuming from Kafka. Um, the other alternative, instead of using Kafka Connect, is of course to use the other parts of the Kafka ecosystem. So Kafka consists of many things. You have the, the cluster, the server part of it. Um, then you have uh, sort of the regular Kafka producers and consumers, which are regular Java clients. I, know they, I believe they also have uh, support for a number of other languages. You have the stream processors, which is what we have looked at now, which are kind of combined producers and consumers. They just they both consume data from Kafka and produce to it. So that's the Kafka Stream API. And then you have this, this connector API that I just mentioned. So you, you can write things using re regular uh, producers and consumers. And this is actually what we are doing in, in our setup, is that we had a, a legacy stream-based uh, solution that already supported a number of uh, the things and such that, that we uh, wanted. So we, we just sort of migrated that code to use Kafka clients to consume from, from Kafka itself. And that's quite simple. It, most of our, our uh, connectors are just one or two pages of code, essentially just uh, going in a loop, fetching data from Kafka, writing it somewhere else. Um, so that's totally doable. Of course, you, you still have the option of using Kafka Connect if you want to use the sort of the full, full ecosystem. Uh, I believe you had a question about S3, right? If you wanted to move data to S3, for example. Uh, so Kafka Connect supports that, I believe. There are also some other, um, other third-party solutions to do that, but I believe those are using the old Kafka library or um, old Kafka versions. But what we are doing is essentially just uh, fetching a batch of events from Kafka and writing them as a, a micro-batch into S3 in our system. All right. Um, yeah. I don't think we have time to do anything useful here. But if you are interested in more details about our platform, you can watch a couple of talks that are available also. Uh, this is my colleague Lars Marius. He, he did a talk at uh, Java Zone. This is actually two years ago, but it still covers most of our platform, how we ingest and process uh, seven or 800 million events per day from our Clickstream uh, data. And then um, some of you already saw my colleague uh, Håkon yesterday, who was talking about doing this uh, enrichment of the events using uh, IP to geo-coordinate lookup. But he also, I'm assuming that the, the, the version that he gave yesterday will be uh, available, uh, the video from that as well, soon. So, um, I think I'm actually quite ahead of time, but there's a bunch of further reading that I would recommend. If you are looking to go in, uh, to start using stream processing, I would highly recommend uh, these two articles, the, bat the World Beyond Batch, they have uh, go into a lot of detail on uh, some of the aspects that I've talked about today in terms of handling of time, how you handle uh, events that are uh, coming in late and so on, and, and going into very good explanations, I think, on, on uh, how that works. Uh, Confluent, the commercial backers behind Kafka, uh, also have a very good blog, I think, with a lot of good articles on how to use Kafka and Kafka streams. Um, I didn't talk about joins now, uh, but we can, if you guys want, we can, we can go into some examples of that as well. I have some slides I can, uh, I can show if you want. Because uh, the talk by my colleague yesterday showed uh, some examples of how that uh, didn't work so well for us. But I can, I can show some examples of uh, how to do this in uh, the Streams API. So just unhide some of my slides here. Uh, Yeah. So, um, joining streams and enriching your data. Since we have about 10 minutes left, I think that's a good topic to dive into a little bit. So, joining your streams, uh, do not cross your streams, right? Or <laughs> um, 
but sometimes you do want that, and and it it has very powerful mechanisms for for kind of joining. Uh, data together. You can do multiple types of joins inside of Kafka Stream. So here, I'm not going to go into detail on all of this because that's a long blog post on that Confluent blog in itself. But you can join two K streams together, or you can join various combinations of K streams and K tables. And you have also this thing called global K table, which I haven't touched on today really, but it's, it's essentially a K table that has uh, the same state across all nodes. So if you have some sort of um, metadata that you want to enrich everything, all your events with, you will put that isn't that big, you will put that in a global K table and all of your nodes will have access to the same, same data. And you can do different types of joins here. Uh, if you're familiar with joins from, S from SQL, then you know, you, know, like you can do uh, inner joins, left joins, and so on, depending. So an inner join will join the events if they are, if you have events that match, that come in from both, uh, both sides. A left join will uh, join anything coming in on the left side with whatever it has on the right side, and then the outer join will join all combinations together, so giving you potential null values here and there, but depending on what you want, that's, uh, that's what's available. So let's dive into a short example here. So uh, staying on the same kind of topic uh, with the art news articles, uh, I want to see, so I have a set of uh, click events, essentially, articles being read, and I have some information uh, about my users, my logged in users in the table. So I want to join these two together to enrich these article event or click events with uh, some more information. So in this case, I'm trying to f get the reads, uh, the number of reads by country, right? So I know which country my users are, are from. So I can do this, uh, I can do a join of this table with the stream. So what I will have then is that uh, um, I will have article and user events coming in together and I, I need to uh, tell it where, um, yeah, what, what is the output of that join. And in this case, I'm just interested in the users, uh, the country of the user. And then I can take this reads by country and uh, do what we saw earlier. I can uh, do a group by that, um, the country name and do a count, right? The, the, the trick here to be able to do this join, these two have to have the same keys. Uh, to be able to, for, for Kafka to be able to join them, you have to use the same keys uh, in, in both uh, your left and right hand side here. So, so what I need to do potentially here, if it isn't already using the user ID as a key, I will need to do this kind of reselect key operation that I mentioned briefly before, so that I can get a new stream that has the same keys as my user table. Because then it can, first of all, uh, it will ensure that all of the events that are supposed to be joined, again, end up on the same processing node, similar to when we did the aggregation operation. Um, but once that is satisfied, uh, it will do this join out automatically, output, in this case, uh, all of the, the countries from this, uh, from, for, so for, for each event coming in here, it will look up in the table find the appropriate user object, and, uh, and uh, I can then extract the country from there and, and produce essentially a stream that just contains a list of countries, right? So for this, I, I see uh, Norway, Norway, Spain, Germany, France, and so on. Um, and then I can group by that and do the count and aggregation. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Joins are quite powerful, and, and uh, it's taken me quite a while to sort of understand how they, how they work, how they actually do this based on, since <laughs> essentially you, when you're dealing with streams of events, uh, of course, it's not the same as joining a database table where all of your data is present, 
the events come in at different times, right? So when you're joining this K table with a, a K stream, that's kind of simple because it will only, for each event coming in on the stream, it will just look up the corresponding uh, value in your <laughs> aggregate state store. But if you're joining two streams together, you need to deal with what is the time window I'm looking at for a join, what is my join time window, and so on. So you can configure that in your joins, saying that I want to join every matching event that comes in within five minutes, for example. Yes, behind, in the back. Can we? Sorry, yeah. Please. I was asking, how do you make sure that uh, an instance of your application uh, gets the same keys from the partitions from the different topics? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So how, how do you ensure that the, the same... So the articles for a user match up on the same node as the user data for that user, essentially, yes. Um, so the trick is, of course, um, th there's, there's two things you need to do. First of all, you need to ensure that you have the same keys on the events, as I mentioned. So you need to re-key your article uh, read events with the user ID for that event. Uh, in addition, you need to ensure that you're, if you're joining two streams, for example, you need to ensure that both streams have the same number of partitions. Uh, otherwise, uh, if, if one stream has five partitions and the other has seven, then it will not be able to sort of match them up. So, uh, so that's, uh, those are the two kind of considerations you need to, to make there. And, and you can do this kind of inside of Kafka streams uh, in the repartitioning. All right, and there was a question up here as well. Yeah. Um, so do each one of these operations uh, emit a subsequent stream to Kafka? So, so in the join operation, for example. The join operation here will emit essentially one event per event coming in on the stream here. But if you are joining two streams together, you can have multiple events as there can be multiple matches inside of the time, the join window. Is that and, and then the output of the join is that another stream. Yeah, that's another stream, exactly. Here, it's just a case stream. It may be materialized inside Kafka streams or inside, inside your Kafka cluster or not. It might just be internally in your Kafka streams application. Although I think it will actually have it uh, be materialized. So there's, I'm not going to go into details on the joins themselves, but there's, uh, again, these articles I mentioned, uh, there's uh, another one here. Uh, that I had in my read list it goes into a lot of detail. If you want to figure out how joints work, this has a lot of examples on what is the incoming events, what is the output, depending on whether you're doing an inner stream join or an outer join or table join and so on. So that's, yeah, that's a topic for a, a whole talk on or a workshop on its own. Enrichments. Um, so you can also, of course, enrich events with information from external sources. And this is what my colleague talked about uh, yesterday. Because uh, essentially your Spark code, or sorry, your Kafka Streams code is just regular Java code. You can do whatever you want inside your map values, for example. You can call out to a third party service, fetch some data, and add that to your event. And that's your enrichment. Uh, you also have this more low-level API that I mentioned that's called the processor API. Or, or there are actually two of them. There's one called processor and one called transformer. Um, they're very similar, but uh, sort of different levels of the API. And you can use that for more batch-oriented processing where you have, you can collect a set of events and you have some punctuation calls and stuff like that. So you can, you can do more uh, batch-oriented. If you want to, for example, batch uh, events up before you call a service instead of calling it for each individual event. So I believe that's what the one we're actually using now for our GeoIP enrichment. Instead of doing the joins, we're doing this, this kind of enrichment instead. All right. Uh, let's skip through this. So yeah, we went through this thing already. Uh, there's a lot of good documentation on the Confluent site, uh, confluent.io site on Kafka streams and Kafka in general. Uh, you also have similar documentation on the Kafka Apache site as well. So. With that, I want to say thank you for uh, listening. And I think we have three more minutes if there are any more questions yeah. at the end. Thank you. There's one here. 
Yeah, so uh, I'm involved in the Apache Agent project, and mm -hmm. uh, I was sort of, uh, while you were talking, I was sort of comparing it with what we're doing there. So it seems to, to uh, uh, be a perfect addition to Kafka streams, because especially with IoT and Edge devices, yeah, yeah. you usually don't have a cluster to work with. Yeah, yeah. So having almost the same syntax just without the key concept, uh, mm -hmm. it seems like a perfect addition to sort of... Uh, Build your IoT applications. Yeah, actually, the, the first project I, where I worked with uh, Kafka was in an IoT setting where we had sensors sending in events from households about power usage and, and stuff like that. So it, it was a quite perfect fit for that, actually. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. One, there was, uh, one over here. Yeah. Um, I don't quite understand uh, how uh, Grubit Stream would work without being window in time. Like, don't you need the concept of start and end to be able to aggregate data? I, you can do aggregations in time windows, but you can also sort of just do a continuous aggregation, uh, sort of from from the first event that you consume until. Uh, and uh, so, th what what will happen in both the global aggregations and in the time window aggregations is that it, Kafka will periodically produce new incremental results, right? So. Uh, even in the time window ones, as I mentioned, how do you handle out of time, other sort of uh, late events coming in that actually belong to an earlier time window? So you can configure how long you are able to deal with those events. How long should you keep that time window around? And if it sees new events coming in, it will actually publish an updated version of that time window to its change log. So when you query the state store for an older time window, you will get a new result. Uh, and it's kind of similar for sort of global. Uh, aggregations without time windows. It will just ag publish new results periodically for that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. We still have right. time for some questions. Yeah, if not, I will uh, happily stay around outside here or somewhere and uh, have a chat with you if you want to ask me more stuff. So, cool. Well, thank you again. Thank you.